Welcome everyone to this Knowledge Equity Pathways Building Sustainable Futures panel discussion, exploring knowledge as a key driver for sustainability. My name is Peter Batashka and I'm a social entrepreneur and passionate advocate of higher education and sustainability. I'm also the social entrepreneur in residence here at the University of Leeds. I'm the CEO of Cambio House of Social Change, a leading global sustainability practice, and we're delighted to be hosted today by the Knowledge Equity Network, championing knowledge and research for impact. I'm going to briefly introduce our fantastic panelists before they say more about their work. Professor Manuel Barcia has joined us as Dean of Global Engagement at the University of Leeds. We have Matt Bullivant, Director of Sustainability Strategy at Oak North Bank. We have Seb Ellsworth, MBE, CEO of Access, the Foundation for Social Investment. And finally, live from Australia, we have Professor Susie Ho, Director of the Monash Innovation Guarantee at Monash University in Melbourne. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to start with you, Manuel, for your introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, OK, my name is Manuel Barcia. I am the Dean for Global Engagement here at the University of Leeds. I am also a professor of global history at our School of History. As Dean of Global Engagement, uh, my job basically entails looking after the way we interact with international partners from all over the world. We make sure that these interactions are actually based on the university principles and values uh, that we have, we have fostered and we have created over the years. As someone who hails from the Global South, it's also uh, something that is very close to my heart that we work with partners from all over the world on an equal basis so that we create partnerships of equals. Uh, and uh, in, in this way, basically challenging all, all structures uh, of partnerships that we have before. Thank you, Manuel. Matt. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so I'm Matt Bullivant. I'm Director of Sustainability at Oak North Bank. Uh, I also look after our environmental, social and governance strategy. Uh, so I've worked in banking for 20 years and I've looked after sustainability in smaller to mid-sized banks for coming up to a decade, which is probably about as long as there have been heads of sustainability and ESG in financial services. Um, and, and what that means is I look after everything from our commercial strategy to our risk management to our regulatory reporting around sustainability and ESG, uh, employee and external engagement, uh, and our operational integration of, of sustainable matters. Um, and I look at this and have looked at this from both perspective of an investor or financer, considering the sustainability of those investee companies that the bank is financing, uh, to also the inward looking performance and sustainable integration of the operations of and strategy and business model of the banks themselves uh, in integrating these matters. Thank you, Matt. <coughs> Seb. Thanks so much, Peter. Great to be here. My name is Seb Ellsworth. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of Access, the Foundation for Social Investment, which is a UK-based foundation that supports financial inclusion for community scale charities and social enterprises to ensure they can access the, the finance they need to grow, often in the form of small loans, but also uh, support around growing the business models and enterprise activity. Uh, so that they can really deliver uh, as much impact in their communities as, as possible. Uh, I'm also a member of, of the governing body here at the University of Leeds um, and was a student uh, sabbatical officer in the Student Union uh, 20 years ago, so have a very close uh, relationship with, uh, with the university. Uh, since then, my career has, has really spanned different roles in, in civil society uh, support um, across developing uh, leaders in civil society, uh, uh, supporting the building of, of capacity and, and enterprise um, and now uh, more recently really focused on trying to uh, finance the sector, but also influence the broader financial system in a way that uh, ensures that communities have access to the finance that they need to, to grow and develop. And I think in this conversation, I'm really bringing the perspective of trying to engage um, civil society in that network of, uh, around knowledge equity, but also identifying that there are other, other dimensions of equity as well as knowledge. Thank you, Seb. And, and finally, over to you, Susie. Thank you, Peter, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Susie Ho. I'm a professor in environmental science and the UN contact point at Monash University. Um, I also am the director of Enterprise Immersion and the Monash Innovation Guarantee. So I'm tasked with mainstream education for the SDGs across Monash, uh, which is Australia's largest university with 80,000 students and campuses in seven countries. And I design programs to accelerate um, action on the Paris Agreement and 17 goals. I'm also part of UN projects to set up global indicators for quality climate change education. And um, I'm passionate about empowering future leaders. I've taken 10 global youth delegations to the UN, 
where I work on Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, which is around public literacy and education. Thank you, Peter. No, thank you to the whole panel. I think we have a really diverse and interesting group of perspectives to share from all over the world today. And before I move into questions, um, I want to start by thanking Helix for this wonderful facility that we're broadcasting live from today. And of course, a welcome to our online global audience who've joined us and I know will want to share questions with our wonderful panellists throughout the session. Um, there's a lot to cover in a short period of time. I'm going to start with, a, I think, a central question in this discussion, which is, how can knowledge equity help us to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, given that we're now effectively six years away from those? Um, can I come to Matt, you first on this one? Um, so you've probably started with one of the broadest themes there, uh, Peter. So um, uh, I think there's an awful lot to, to kind of tackle uh, within those SDGs. And I think, you know, the first thing that, that everybody reacts in the, in the moment around this is that actually we only have six years. And a lot of the, the conversation around SDGs very recently has been, is that achievable? Is 2030 achievable? Um, and I think the first thing to say there is, is there's probably a danger in being fixated on 2030. Um, and I think what we don't want to do is completely discard the SDGs because we feel that actually it's unachievable because we've overstepped in terms of the target, we've overstepped in terms of ambition. Um, and I think from, an, from a knowledge perspective, I, I think we need to step away from the targets and think about actually where are we trying to drive meaningful change? Where are we trying to drive impact? And this is quite often where corporates struggle in that they approach the SDGs as this broad holistic set. Uh, and they either try and tackle all 17 without really understanding the depth behind them, without really understanding their own meaningful impact and actually why it is relevant to them. Uh, and there are elements now of regulation that's trying to, to kind of steer thought around that. If you look at things like the CSRD in Europe, that is pointing corporates to think about double materiality, to think about actually how the wider world impacts on you as a business and how you impact upon the wider world as a business. Um, and that is, that is a step change in terms of thought for, for corporates to think, well, actually, we are part of this broader ecosystem. We have influence on all of these social, environmental, cultural um, facets around the world, and they influence us as a business. And therefore, where can we have greatest impact? What is most meaningful to us? Because I think that is a challenge that, that is still encountered around SDGs, where you often look at company websites and they've listed out all 17 SDGs and they've listed out something they've done against all of them. And you think, well, are you really having an impact on all 17 SDGs? Do you really understand that there are multiple sub goals within each of those particular um, 17 goals? And that understanding and that knowledge and awareness still even now requires greater transparency, greater awareness, greater understanding from a, from a commercial point of view. And the reason that's important is because actually companies could pick one, two, three of those particular themes, get very narrow, very concentrated, very focused on making meaningful impact on those. And that's far better than trying to address all 17. It's far better than worrying how much can I achieve this year, next year, in six years in order to be able to tick that box. Just step away from that and think, where can I have greatest impact? What has greatest impact on, on me as a business? And therefore, this is the approach I should take. Um, and, I, and I think we still aren't quite there yet in terms of articulating that and, and getting that level of understanding and awareness in terms of business leadership. Absolutely. So having that focus, I think, is what you're saying really matters. And of course, SDG number 17 is all about partnerships. I'm wondering, what do we think the role of global universities is in this discussion? Manuel, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, I was about to jump in and, and, and bring universities into the equation because the universities obviously um, in, in many parts of the world, universities are also businesses. They are, they are private universities, they are public universities which are functioning within a business environment. Um, and universities, especially comprehensive ones, and I'm thinking of this university, for instance, have an opportunity to make a contribution across, um, uh, across the, the 17 SEEs, probably more in depth than many, um, uh, especially small and medium uh, sized uh, businesses can. What it is critical here is that universities work in partnership, both with the private sector and, and governments, but also that we think about, um, about the wider repercussions of every work we do. You know, there is a phrase uh, that, that, uh, that actually encapsulates the, the thinking that I have before coming here, which is like the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
And, and very often we are trying to actually do things that we, with the best intentions in this world to change the world for better. But we actually have to understand that not every partner we work with, and this, this is particularly the case for the Global South, not every partner we, we work with is going to be in the same place as we are. And, and the fear that I have, or the risk here, is that you can drag people out of the comfort zones so that you can meet your, your, your targets here, but what you, you end up is creating a situation somewhere else because, because they don't have the infrastructure or they don't have, uh, or they are not in, in the right state of mind to, to undertake a challenge the same way that you do. And I really think that this, this is a challenge for all of us, but universities in particular, because we, we are extremely engaged with partners from all over the world. And very often, uh, still you see this, I, I travel quite a lot and, and you see it still, you, there is quite a lot of old fashioned, I, I don't want to call it neo-colonial, but there is an, an element of neo-colonial approach as how universities in the global north work with universities in the global south. And this is something we need to challenge and we need to be very aware of whenever we sit down uh, and, and mm -hmm. we start discussing any of the SDGs with any partner from all over the world. Thank you, Manuel. I think that's a really important perspective. And of course, we have Susie here with us mm -hmm. from Australia. And I know you work a lot in the Global South. Do you want to share your perspective? Thank you so much. And I, I agree very much with what you were just saying. I might zoom out to the UN perspective and then back into higher education. I think at the UN and the UNFCCC, so the United Nations Framework on Climate Change Convention, at those meetings, it's very well accepted that you know climate change impacts and the SDGs can't be solved by one discipline, region, you know, culture, industry, community, or individual alone. You need, you know, we need whole of economy global transformations to occur, and that requires partnerships, knowledge sharing, and collaboration on an unprecedented scale. So. The original purpose of the SDGs is to integrate into is to integrate to people that all of the SDGs are interconnected and therefore need to be solved in collaboration. You can't hold all the knowledge on all of them. You can't action all of them. But what you can do is collaborate collaborate across boundaries of discipline, sector, um, and region. And collaboration really is at the heart of knowledge equity. It's about interweaving and understanding different ways of knowing, different forms of knowledge, different perspectives and lived experiences. And it's a pathway to climate justice, intergenerational justice, global citizenship, gender justice, and environmental justice. So at the UN, uh, there's a strong focus on knowledge equity and resource sharing. And that's because the SDGs are the global goals. It's about local to global. And you know, it's particularly around um, knowledge sharing and information across the global north and south. And there is a lot of people at the UN who say that universities, you know, uh, um, should be playing a leadership role in convening these important exchanges um, across in particularly industrialised and developing nations, across governments, nonprofits, research organisations and the private sector. We are uniquely placed. We're kind of viewed as slightly more neutral than some of the other groups to be convening these conversations. And, we had a great moment where we, we felt we were um, making, you know, creating a space um, at the Climate Change Conference in Dubai last year where we ran a pavilion to bring, you know, uh, international cross-sector conversations to the fore in ways that governments couldn't. And uh, we ran 70 events with almost 300 different speakers across all sectors. And I think, you know, that was a really valuable thing to do. So. I think universities can be doing more on SDG 17 to for to convene partnerships to facilitate collaborations that lead to knowledge sharing. So we're talking a lot about finance and education. What about the civil society perspective? So I'm going to come to you next. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you know, as we look at the the breadth of the partnerships that are needed and um, and and the change that needs to happen, it's an absolutely crucial role for, for civil society organisations in that right right around in the world. And and um, you know, civil society organisations at their most fundamental, of course, are organisations that are often developed and led by the people who are most impacted by the challenges that we're trying to solve through the SDGs. Um, and are operating at a scale close, close, closer to those communities, really embedded in in uh, in those communities. So there's an absolutely crucial role for those organisations as advocates, as uh, providers of services to many of those communities, um, and as networks and conveners, right from the local level up to the the global level, um, uh, everything in between. And the UN are very clear about the critical role that civil society organisations need need to play. 
Um, they are traditionally, though, organisations that are less well resourced than uh, than organisations in, in public or, or private uh, sectors. And obviously, finance and, and access to finance is part of that. But access to knowledge is also uh, can be part of that. And, and um, you know, the kind of data infrastructure that often exists in other institutions may be hard uh, for civil society organisations to, to replicate. So I think in the spirit of the role that higher education can play, there are enormous opportunities for, for really deepening that engagement. Uh, and that is right across the, uh, you know, the core uh, aspects that higher education institutions exist to uh, promote around uh, research, both the, the um, convening of, of research uh, and, and the implementation of research, um, challenge-based education, um, and you know, knowledge exchange in a whole variety of ways. And I think it's a mistake to um, assume that all enterprise and innovation sits within the private sector and actually the, um, the entrepreneurial spirit in many civil society organizations, the ability to generate new income streams and revenue models that can be sustainable, that can then translate impact into those communities in a virtuous cycle is, is really strong. And, and that's an area where I think there can be enormous opportunity for more collaboration with higher education. While we've been having this conversation here, we've had a question come in from our online audience. The question is, what are the most urgent actions needed right now to accelerate progress towards meeting those SDGs? Does anyone on the panel have a view on, on that? I'd say to make sure that we share this knowledge equitable. Um, we, have, we have plenty of initiatives and, and I pretty much agree with what the other panelists have said, but we definitely can do better than what we are doing right now. And again, this, this comes from, from, from approaches that we take um, uh, that, that sometimes are, are counterproducing. And, and a classic example are initiatives around open access. Uh, uh, we, we see them, we see them uh, coming up all the time and, and they are done with the best possible intentions. But in reality, what happens is that we end up benefiting from open access in the global north, you, you know, British universities, Europeans, Americans, we managed to, thanks to this initiative, we managed to publish our papers in open, uh, open access, the whole world can access these, these papers. They are widely cited. In, in the meantime, colleagues in the Global South, they can access our papers and they can cite our papers, but they are still publishing behind paywalls because they don't have the same uh, kind of financial backing that we have. Therefore, what we are really doing is actually opening a chasm between us and them, in, rather than actually creating the conditions to have to foster innovation, to foster uh, a collaboration, what we, what we are doing is actually uh, taking people apart, if you wish, because we are, we are actually benefiting from open access what most of the world is not. Yeah. Thank you, please. And, yeah. I'll, and I'll chip in there, Peter, and just I completely agree with everything Manuel was saying. I, and I think uh, what I'm going to echo is, is what's already been alluded to around collaboration here, um, because I think there's a, there's a trap, certainly from a corporate point of view, with around the themes like the SDGs, the companies feel like they have to do it all. And the reality is, is that companies aren't able to do it all. They don't have the capability. They can't assess social impact. They can't evaluate biodiversity. They're not very good at carbon accounting. All of these sorts of themes are, are challenging for, for corporates to get to grips with, but they're trying to do it themselves. And there's you know, particular industry. I come from the banking industry. We're very guilty of it. Maybe the legal industry, maybe insurance industry. They're quite insular, they're very protectionist, they don't like to kind of open up and almost show weakness by looking for support elsewhere. Fundamentally, we need to change that mindset to say, hey, actually, we need to look to experts, owners of those sorts of sources of knowledge, um, and, and engage with this, yeah. and be much more willing to do that in order to effectively drive impact and change that we can deliver upon. Thank you, Matt. That's a perfect segue into our next question, our next theme around knowledge exchange. So what role for knowledge exchange as a meaningful vehicle for delivering SDGs, but in reality, for people, for social justice, and of course, the principles of equality, uh, diversity and inclusion. Any thoughts on the panel on knowledge exchange? Seb, I might come yeah. to you first of all. I imagine that a lot of the organisations, the individuals, the entrepreneurs you work with within Access and, and, and civil society as a whole are looking for access points into some of these bigger institutions. How easy is that for you? Um, it, it's not always uh, it's not always straightforward to understand uh, for many civil society organisations working at a community scale um, what those uh, what those access points um, are and and I do think that is a critical um, a critical factor in terms of um, you know improving uh, equity around uh, around knowledge access and I think you know going back to the point I made earlier these are 
organisations often representing the communities that are most impacted by the challenges that the um, SDGs are, are seeking uh, to address. And if we just take um, climate change as an example and the, um, you know, the, the, the driver towards a just transition, it is, um, you know, the, the, as we all know, the communities that are um, most, most impacted around the world, but also just taking a UK context, you know, many of the communities um, you know, not, not far from here in, in Leeds who have been through uh, you know, one industrial transformation in the last generation and, and will have to go through another and are probably you know, among the least resilient to, to be able to do so. Um, you know, it, it's absolutely critical that we're able to, to share the, 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 the knowledge but the other resources that are needed with those communities in order, uh, in order to make that happen. And, and I think um, you know, access to knowledge is a, is a critical principle and, and, and um, the, the frameworks of the, of the network are really big, big, important part of that. But we can't just assume that making knowledge available means that it is used and absorbed within those communities. And we have to make sure that it is um, contextualized in a way that, that makes sense for different communities, that it is um, embedded in networks that those communities and those civil society organizations already have a relationship with, because reading academic papers is probably not something that they think to do, even if they, they literally do have, uh, have access to it. And so by really trying to understand what barriers are existing uh, in order to access that knowledge, we must think really creatively about the, the methods of, of delivering that and the methods of, um, of making, uh, making that um, you know, something they can really benefit from. Thank you, Seb. I'm, I'm very conscious in this part of the conversation that knowledge exchange has a quite a specific definition in a university context. And Susie, if I may come to you, mm -hmm. I, I know you are heavily involved at Monash University with the Monash Innovation Guarantee and also with you know, concepts of commercialising and spinning out or spinning in potential solutions within your, your local community, your local ecosystem. What does knowledge exchange mean to you in that context? Oh, I think... Um... I think at, at um, the core, I think, you know, coming back to collaboration, it's about valuing different forms of knowledge and integrating those different forms of knowledge. So coming back to the UN, I think the primary focus of the UN is on vulnerable groups who are most impacted, disproportionately impacted by unsustainable practices and climate change. So women and girls, the LGBTIQ plus community, people in poverty, people in conflict zones, First Nations peoples and those from the least developed states. So are there forms of knowledge, wisdom and perspectives and lived experiences actually valued and incorporated in decision making and in research to the extent that they need to be is, is the question I ask. And I think, I think uh, you know, we're moving forward in this space, but um, there is a lot that we can do to further appreciate diver diverse forms of knowledge in our work. In an educational context at Monash, what we've done is run three flagship rich educational experiences based on the SDGs. And these engage students uh, with diverse actors, you know, everyone from Microsoft to Amnesty International and local communities in eight different countries. And these are freely accessible and, and free in a financial sense to all students at Monash. And the aim is to have them work in intercultural context, cross-sector co context, on issues and hear those diverse perspectives and integrate them into the solutions um, they're working. So to put it to put it in um, in short, it's about working with and for communities and different knowledge systems. I think um, from a commercialization and spin out and startup point of view, I'd also talk about the fact that historically the climate and sustainability space has been rooted in, dare I say, a Western science tradition. I'm from science myself. Um, and I think in a disciplinary and a sectorial sense, we have to, you know, move between, you know, beyond those principles of Western physical science as the fount of all knowledge and really value equally what business has to say, what local communities have to say, what First Nations people have to say, and those people most impacted, and they need to be valued. And I think also we're moving towards valuing social sciences in these conversations more and more as well, which is really important. And in fact, you know, there are calls for there to be a sister body to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the physical science that focuses on the social and behavioural and human rights issues behind this. So not sure if I've answered your question, but hope that helps, Peter. No, thank you, Susie. I mean, you brought us into another area which I think is equally as important, which is around inclusion 
and not just the, as you say, physical side, but also the social behavioral side of things. I wonder, and this is open to the whole panel really, in terms of trends that we see emerging around the intersection between EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion, and if you like, knowledge equity or knowledge exchange, where are we on that? Badly. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Okay. I, I, I might, yeah. Shall I step in with something mildly controversial? Indulge me. Please. <laughs> I, I think what often happens from a corporate point of view is, is the, the concept of diversity of thought is often the the license used and the terminology used to, to, to bring this into the way corporates try and address diversity and inclusion. And, and I think it's very important. And of course, it brings, uh, it brings innovation, it brings creativity, it brings entrepreneurial thought, or all of those things that come with uh, a diverse set of ideas and concepts and awareness and, and integrating all of that. And uh, and even in, in sort of election period that we're in in the UK at the moment, there's a lot on the agenda around growth and how do you get growth in corporates? Well, actually, you need to drive innovation. You need to drive that creativity. And actually, there, there's a strong role for it there. But I think the, the, the almost controversial point I would say around this is that um, diversity of thought is, is great, but there's more to diversity than just diversity of thought. And I think what sometimes happens is that there's there's almost a blunt instrument in a lot of the metrics that are used from a corporate point of view where we align demographic demographic diversity markers with diversity of thought and i think we need to be more sophisticated in terms of thinking about it than that um and i and i think it, that it, it isn't necessarily a pitfall but i i think what often happens is that underserved or minority groups if if companies start to look at that in terms of proportional representation well, actually, those underserved groups and those minorities still get under-recognized. You actually need to over-index in terms of actually yeah. bringing that in. And I think that concept is missed in terms of how it gets interpreted, looking statistically or looking at demographic markers. And we need to actually bring in the sectoral view. We need to bring in the actual idea creativity side of things. And actually, I think universities have a role to play because of their networks and, and connectivity in that sort of space. Absolutely, man. I'm struck, Manuel, that you said badly. So can you Well, no, but he, on that? he has a point, actually. Mm. And, and there is a lot of books speaking um, when it comes to diversity, inclusion and, and diversity. Um, sorry, and equity. Um, I, I really think that there is, there is a principle that is not always recognized. And I agree very much with what Susie was saying, that we need to bring every actor in, into the equation here. It's not just the ones who come up with ideas. Everybody has to contribute. Um, and, and I really think that when it comes to equity in particular, um, we very often fail to recognize that every actor, every person, every, every person in this planet starts at a different place. We, we don't, we, not, all, not all of us have the same education or the same, the same upbringing or the same understanding of the issues. And I think that, that if we really mean to be inclusive, if we really mean to actually have different opinions, diverse opinions, and if we really bring to, mean to, 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 to create an equitable Feel of play for all of us to contribute. These differences, these this uh, different um, uh, you know path that people follow needs to be recognized because the risk that we that, that we fall. I mean, we are taking if we don't do that is that we again because there is uh, unfortunately there is always a dominance from the richest countries in, on the planet is that we try to drag people from all parts of the world into our own. Uh, understanding of issues and SEEs are a classic example of this. So, um, and, and there are many things that we are trying to do. We are trying to actually take climate change, for instance. We are actually trying to um, to uh, introduce new technologies, clean technologies uh, that they are critical for, for our own survival as a species down the line. But as we do this, we actually have to take into consideration that there are places in the world that they are not ready for the transition yet. They need to create a wealth they need to, to actually feed their families before they get to the point in which they can actually be in that place. And what we can do is actually to bring them faster to that place, but not to go there and tell them you're falling behind. And I have seen this happen. I've, be, I've seen this in, in practice, you know, colleagues from other parts of the world, people from other parts of the world that are actually being pushed to, to catch up in a way they cannot catch up. And we need to acknowledge that uh, at the very least, we need to be patient. But what we need to do is more effective, really. What we need to do is, is to actually engage more. It, we, knowledge, for instance, is, is something we need to share openly across the board, not in a corner of the world. 
if this is the only way that you're going to get people with different traditions coming together and actually creating new stuff. That is where innovation actually uh, is, is created. And, and as long as we don't do that, yes, we are not, we are not well. You know? We've actually had a question from our audience on this, um, and it links back to the point that Matt made about the fact that in the UK here we have a general election coming up in early July. And of course, over half the world's population have elections this year. We've seen already elections in South Africa, in India. We have an election in the US, of course, as well and beyond. The question is, what role can technology play in democratizing access to knowledge and information? Um, who wants to come in on the technology and democracy aspect of this discussion? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to come in and, and just build on, on the point that, that was uh, made. I'm, I'm not an expert on, on technology, but, but I think um, you know, we must be very careful to see technology as, as, as a means and not an end uh, to, to, to that and, and not a sufficient um, uh, tool that, that you know, because the technology exists, therefore communities can access this information. I think, you know, the, as I was saying before, the, the contextualizing of it um, the the kind of bringing people to its relevance is is as important as, as making it freely available um, and so you know technology obviously has huge advantages in terms of reducing the cost of distribution and and, and increasing the um, ease of access to the knowledge if you know to look for it and if you know how to understand it and if you know its relevance to you but I I guess I would urge us to to you know see it as part of a uh, infrastructure that enables knowledge to be shared more more equitably, but but not the end in itself. Mm. Please, Matt. No, the only thing I was going to add there is I think the other side of the coin there is is not just necessarily the use of technology in the dissemination of knowledge and the awareness of knowledge, but also the ability for technology to free up time for corporates, governments, whoever it may be, to actually put thought into how we create access, how we drive impact, how we actually bring everybody along on a democratic journey here. And, and that is an efficiency thing rather than just a distribution thing. And I think that's a really important area there. And I don't want to kind of dive into an AI conversation, but obviously that's a lot where that goes in terms of driving efficiency and, um, and freeing up time for considering things more fully. Mm. It's interesting, actually. I'll, I'll bring you in, in yeah. a second moment because we've got 30 minutes into the discussion and we've just touched on AI. I think we've done really well. <laughs> but there's no way of ignoring the impact of AI that it's having today, but of course, crucially in the future. Does anyone want to say a bit about what their hopes are for AI? I, I want to say something before we jump into, into AI because I, I really think it's important. It's from a university point of from, from an education point of view. Mm. And as you know, quality education is, is one of the SEEs anyway. Um, I really think that technology uh, is already playing a, a critical role uh, on this and it's, it's likely to become more and more central. Uh, te with, with technology, we can actually reach communities, we can reach uh, people that before they didn't have access to higher education. So actually, this university is working on that right now in partnership with Pretoria, with the University of Pretoria. But there is also um, uh, a, a technology is playing a critical role in, in public health. Uh, and, and again, reaching communities that are isolated. Uh, so, it, and, and I actually think that linking up with this AI is likely to actually um, uh, be the next step here. Uh, there, there may be, uh, I don't think that any of us is a specialist in technology, as, as I was saying, but I, I really think that there is, uh, there is already quite a lot of um, uh, evidence to, to, to suggest that AI is going to become central to um, to any developments, the technological developments we have in the next in the next mm. few decades, probably for longer than that. And we are mm. just in the infancy right now. Uh, at the same time, and this is something that we have seen in all these dystopic films uh, over over the years, right? Is that there are always people who are gonna fight new technologies, um, from the flat earthers to to you know people who actually come from a technological background. Um, I, I was uh, commenting this before the panel that there is an article just came out. I think a couple of days ago, and the title of the article, this is an academic article, the title of the article is Chat GPT is Bullshit. Mm -hmm. Sorry, probably you have to blank this. Um, and, and so this is, this is not going to be a one direction uh, bomb ride, uh, bomb free ride. This is going to be a very uh, a problematic, um, uh, the, the history of AI is going to be a problematic history. And, and we are already seeing it from the beginning with all the stuff that happened in, in the Silicon Valley with the, the founder of ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. so. so just to turn it on its head for a moment, I wonder, Susie in Australia, are you seeing any specific use cases for AI in this space that are working? 
in in uh, the the climate field or the sustainability field or in education, Peter? Really, in any of the work that you're doing. Mm. Uh, look, I think you know AI is here. It's here to stay. We're all using it, and um, you know, in terms of an education sense, we've got to be training students to use it and giving them equitable access to the tools they need to use it in their future. Yeah. Um, to some of the other panelists' points, I do think it's just a tool in our toolbox. I think in some communities, your best source of information is the local faith leader, is an elder in that community, it might be radio. So it's one of many different tools. Um, overall, I think it, it can play an important role in helping people cut through and synthesise some of the complexities around policy and around in, in distill information together in this very big space. I've seen that used very effectively. Um, and of course, you know, with, with startups and spin outs, it's just magic for helping you form those persuasive cases and those business proposals. So look, I think it's going to be used in many different ways, but I would just caution overall um, and thinking about tech more broadly, more broadly than AI, you know, uh, tech, climate tech, ag tech, it's not a silver bullet. And, you know, we do have to come back to the fact that technology is also the reason that we're in the, you know, in the situ situation that we are today in terms of climate and, and uh, decarbonisation. At the UN, we often discuss that actually a lot of the nature-based solutions, so the natural solutions uh, to the SDGs are far more effective than any of the tech coming through. However, the tech is sexy and the tech sells to corporates and to governments and it makes a more compelling case. So I think it's definitely valuable, AI, climate tech, but um, it's part of a toolbox and um, needs to be considered that way, not a silver bullet. Thank you, Susie. And of course, you work, I know, a lot in partnership, of course, in and around the UN space, but also at Monash. And Manuel, you've mentioned, of course, the partnership of the Knowledge Equity Network with the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, the next question is around those knowledge networks and partnerships. Do we think as a panel that international knowledge networks and partnerships offer credible opportunities to solve climate change? What do you think those might be? Um, I, I said that, you know, uh, this is a trial and error process, right? So we, we are all doing the best we can. Uh, but the, the, the key issue here is that you cannot solve these problems if you don't work in partnership. So we have here at the University of Leeds, we have the Priestley uh, Center for International Climate, or sort of Priestley International Center for Climate. That's the right name. Uh, and and uh, there are colleagues there, like uh, Professor Doug Parker, that they, they have been working for years with partners from all over the world. We, we had an event recently in Brussels that our by chancellor attended in person, uh, in which there were partners from Africa also um, uh, interacting with with our own staff over there, and and these these are colleagues from the from the um, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, which I visited a couple of weeks ago actually, and the partnership between Leeds and this university, as well as Pretoria, I think, uh, has even led to a Queen Anniversary Prize uh, last year. Uh, so. I, I really think that, that um, and I probably said it's going to want to chip in at uh, the moment I bring this issue uh, up. I really think that the, the, the important bit here is that, yes, we can work in partnerships, but we also need to figure out how we fund these partnerships. And this is a critical issue because where is this funding coming from? It's coming from the private sector. Are we going to take the money from donors? Obviously, there are always going to be ethical reasons around whose money we take. Um, uh, we can take. Uh, uh, is it going to come from universities? Is it going to come from governments? Again, ethical issues with all of them. Uh, the, the key for this to function is that you need to come to a point in which these partnerships are partnerships of equals. The uni for instance, for us, going to one of these places and being the main partner doesn't make any sense. We cannot go there and teach people how to do stuff that they probably can teach us how to do better. Yeah. Uh, and this, this, is, this needs to be very clear when we engage in this kind of partnerships. Yeah. And I think we are getting to a point, and probably Susie, Susie's nodding, I think pro because I know that Monash has been working on, on some of these things for a while as well. Um, I think we're getting to a point in which we are starting to learn from our mistakes in the past and to, and to create this kind of partnerships of equals with, with colleagues from all over the world. 
but I do I do have a fear, and and this this may be personal bias because again I'm coming from the global south myself, that you still see the opposite. You you see, see the ugly side of this of this uh, of this. Um, uh, I don't know Hydra. I don't know. It's it's still there. So for it's it's important that we continue to um, to make sure that that these these partnerships are actually. Um, uh, the, 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 when we enter in a partnership, we are all entering the same on the same basis. We are all contributing in the same way, one way or another. Either it's a funding or workload or whatever it is, and we are taking out as well as equals. Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, it's extraction, which no. is what we were doing in the past. Absolutely. Of course, we could come on to Susie. I think in a moment, talk a bit about loss and damage and what's happening at a governmental level. But I think many of our audience would argue that <clears throat> from a funding perspective, the banking sector, financial sector, ought to bear some of that burden. Um, Matt, I'll come to you. Where is that money going to come from? So I think some of what we're alluding to here in terms of sharing knowledge and partnerships, I actually think comes down to trust. And and, and I, I say this from a, a sort of, I'm going to say a Western perspective, in the for matters like climate change, for example, if we're sat in London, yes, we've experienced flooding. And yes, we've experienced the odd heat wave. We haven't experienced flooding like they have in Pakistan. We haven't experienced wildfires like they have in California. I know that's Western, but it's still, it's, it's almost part of the somebody else's problem trap in terms of, of what you actually see. Now, we are aware of those things happening, but actually in terms of deployment of funds, it's a case of saying, well, how do we know that they're going to the right places? You need experts on the ground. You need those actually experiencing it, knowing how on the ground to resolve those problems to give that feedback in a trusted mechanism so that actually that finance can flow. So I think there is an issue of trust there in terms of actually knowing that it's going to the right places. Um, I think there's also a much broader systemic shift here around actually what return constitutes. And it is not necessarily just commercial return. There is a broader network in terms of social support, in terms of actually the, the, the broader themes around climate change you know, are these technologies, are these wider world investments bankable? And actually, the banking network has such broad influence um, that, that that actually there is some value in that, that banks need to recognise that, that there is a perhaps a slightly different banking model here in terms of actually where the return comes from in terms of where they put their cash. Mm. Um, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, you allude to the kind of the responsibility of the banking sector there. I think that partly that comes with scale. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, does the banking sector have the responsibility to drive social change or to to drive behavioural change towards these things? I think that's that's got a big question. I think, Rick. Does it have the responsibility to facilitate the flow of capital where it is most needed? Absolutely. And that is the fiduciary duty of the banking sector to do. And it needs to be able to remove those blockers that stop the flow of capital to where it is required and where there is demand for it. And that means stepping outside of our comfort zone and working with yeah. local partners and experts and those that are more familiar with these sort of themes and concepts than the banking sector has ever had to tackle before. And I think that is that is a, a level of awareness that isn't quite there yet in terms of, of generating traction. Mm. Interesting, Matt. And, and coming to your left with Seb, I I wonder what's the um, interrelationship here with civil society. We talk about social investment. Is there an opportunity there? Huge opportunity. And I think, you know, first of all, we need to think of, uh, you know, climate change as a social challenge, uh, which, you know, it, it absolutely is. And, um, you know, there's a lot of what Matt said there that, that I agree with. But I, I think the, the role of shifting that system and shifting those incentives lies beyond the financial uh, system itself. Um, and uh, you know there is definitely a role for civil society in terms of um, you know delivering a lot of that transition, um, but also you know building the evidence base, really connecting it to communities uh, in terms of of, of how things uh, how things change. But we you know the 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 investment potential in the new technologies that will deliver greener energy, that will deliver greener transport, um, are an enormous uh, incentive for not just the banking system, but for the broader financial services uh, sector. A lot of that is already being being realised, um, but how it impacts more deeply into communities, how it impacts more in, in the global south, um, you know, needs new incentives, needs new financial products. There's definitely a role for government in that, and, and we're seeing that you know in, in governments around the world in terms of incentivising different flows of capital. 
Um, but there's a, you know, for many, from many investors' point of view, there is there is a, a need to really fundamentally shift mindsets and perceptions of risk and uh, conceptions of value that represent, you know, the actual realities of the world that we're living in, the real risks that uh, that, that we face. And I think, you know, we are seeing that in some of the drives around uh, around impact investing. Um, some of the work, for example, that's happening at LSE and the Grantham Institute around, you know, really thinking about how the financial system can be re-engineered to develop um, new financial products, but also develop the measurement frameworks around tackling uh, tackling climate change specifically um, are, are really good examples in that. So, you know, there, there's a there's a systemic uh, change underway across the entire financial services uh, industry that you know banks obviously play a play a critical role in, but longer term investors really need to be thinking about and actually charitable foundations as well as a big part of and a rich part of civil society have an enormous uh, role to play there in the way that they deploy their capital um, but also fund the you know you're, you're absolutely right Manuel, the, the the shorter term challenge around how you actually fund the collaboration and fund the participation um, is, is definitely something that uh, you know more funders need to be considering seriously. Thank you Seven and then Susie I do want to come on to you to talk about loss and damage what role for global governments here and we hear about and obviously primarily or chiefly through those COP negotiations that you, you've been at are global governments carrying the can here and to what degree is that happening across the global north and global south? Yeah great question loss and damage is the big issue um, of uh, UN meetings and it's basically the principle that industrialized nations should provide compensation to developing nations for the impacts that they are suffering, including existential threats to their culture and livelihood, such as in Fiji, due to the historical and current unsustainable practices of wealthy nations. In terms of climate finance, so far, I think there's something like um, almost 400 million been pledged across industrialized nations which is several several orders of magnitude lower than it is what is required at the moment what we're seeing at these un meetings is that um the um 77 group which is uh, a largely um a global south driven group of 77 countries is really banding together to put pressure on this issue and that pressure is you know pushing governments towards further contributions but i think I think there is um, uh, there's a bit of a stalemate at the moment, and so we're we're hoping to see change. And I think also there are concerns from the global south about you know to some of the points you were discussing before how that funding will be equitably and transparently and quickly uh, deployed into the areas that need it most, and that will be largely through the World Bank. And there are some concerns around that. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, did that answer your question, Peter? Sorry. <laughs> no, it did, Susie. I guess as you were answering, I was thinking, what are the systemic barriers here? Why isn't this happening? Well, oh, that's a big question. I'm not sure if, if you know, provocatively, if I had to guess, it's, it is, there is an element of, of um, precedent behind it. You know, where, where, where does this start and where does it stop? And I think um, for that reason, um, the conversations have stalled. I think there's also an education and literacy piece here. So if you're in Ghana or if you're in Fiji, no one in the population is denying climate change. It's on their front door. Their fresh water is being polluted by seawater, seawater uh, uh, rising sea levels. Uh, they're suffering enormous droughts. And so the whole population and the government is sort of behind it. And I think there's also an element of voters in industrialised nations because, as you were saying before, it's out of sight, out of mind, and we're buffered by our wealth, not kind of having the urgency um, behind their responses to the same extent as other least developed states. So I, I think it's not as visceral for us, and that is a problem um, for voters and for governments. Thank you, Susie. And we had another question come in on, you talked earlier about democracy, voters. Um, of course, just last weekend, in fact, I was in Luxembourg, and we had the results of the European elections come through in general terms we have the rise of far-right parties that are promising simple solutions often to really complex problems um, and this is to the whole panel really um, how do we tackle that how do we tackle this sense of a lack of proximity equals a lack of attachment to facts and science what role for knowledge in that space I mean I think the one of the areas that I'll pick up on on, on 
what happened in, in Europe recently was was actually what happened to the Green parties in that they actually went backwards quite considerably. And I think we've touched on this already to some extent, that it's really important with issues like climate change that we bring everybody on the journey with us. And I think the danger has been here that, that a certain number of those ambitions have been pushed so hard that there are segments of society who have either felt like it's been imposed upon them or that it has had a detrimental effect on them economically or, um, uh, or socially. And the natural reaction to that is to push back against it. And I think that you, you see that in all walks, you know, even in the UK in terms of what happens with the, the desperate need we have for, for grid infrastructure and those communities, those coastal communities who don't want pylons in their backyard. And, and it's, it's really important that we actually engage properly here rather than just force the agenda, even though we're short on time and it's really important. And I think it comes back to, to that sort of knowledge and awareness tran transfer of being able to articulate why it's critical, but also to give those sorts of communities a voice in terms of actually how it might work for them and where the challenges are. And yes, it's complicated, but I think if we just take a really blunt approach, then we're going to lose people along the way. And if we lose people, then basically nothing happens and, and everything goes into reverse. And I think that's part of the, the problem that's happened in Europe in terms of trying to be front foot forward on so much of this. It's left behind certain groups who are now reacting. Yeah. I, I agree with this. Um, two issues here, two, two, two things. The first one is I uh, completely agree with what you're saying, but there is, this also presents an opportunity to certain groups, um, certain political groups, uh, to, make, to score easy points, right? And the press very often actually follows uh, because if they sell newspapers or, or whatever, because people actually turn on the TV. That's one thing I, I do want, because you're bringing up the right wing, um, a rise in, in Europe at the moment. But it's th th this, this um, uh, pushing that you're talking about actually has consequences beyond Europe and beyond the United States. There, are, there is extraction of minerals uh, in, in parts of Africa, like Timor, for instance, that is actually leading to conflict in, in places like Eastern Congo, uh, you name it. Uh, this, this very often they get lost in translation because they are so far from us that they are not important. And they are. So the rise of the, of the right is, is a concern. We should all be concerned here. And as, you know, as a historian, um, since 2012, 2013, I have been saying that I feel more and more that I'm actually reliving the 1930s, which is a scary thing to say. Uh, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge that we are not the only exponent of human experience. There are people living in other parts of the world who are actually going through worse stuff. And sometimes we are the cause because we are actually trying to improve the world. We are trying to actually make this a better place, but uh, we are doing that not uh, in, the, in, in the persuasive um, uh, educational way that we should be doing it. Um, and, and, and that's an unfortunate uh, consequence. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, two, two, two things to, to, to add. I mean, I hinted at it before, but the, you know, the, the, the framing, you know, in, in, in perhaps in, in Europe, particularly around, um, you know, climate change is not something that is happening to the planet. It's something that is happening to people and communities and, right. you know, absolutely framing it around what, um, you know, what uh, will happen to people's families and children and, and grandchildren, you know, is, is you know, obviously something many people do, but, but, but critically important. And, and framing um, the, the transition we need to go through, not as a, as a cost and a price and a, and a punishment for our past sins, but as an opportunity in terms of shifting the economy into um, new industries and and, uh, and and with new benefits. Now, obviously, every transition brings risks, and we've talked about many of them uh, already. But um, you know, we we seem to always be talking about the the cost and the price rather than framing it around uh, the opportunities that that can come. And you know, narrative matters in that. Thank you, Seb. And mm -hmm. Susie, please. Thank you so much. I have two little points. Two is, you know, one we do have to acknowledge that the SDGs were developed during a relatively stable time geopolitically and financially and, and we are in a hard phase right now interestingly with the swing to the far right in europe and beyond i think i saw some stats if i'm correct that actually there's quite a large swing in, in young people mm. in the sort of you know uh under 30s group which is, is quite surprising and um it, it really is that backdrop of economic insecurity 
conflict and, and a lot of other things that is maybe deprioritizing this issue uh, for them. Um, I still think given that situation that, um, you know, this has come up quite a lot, education and public literacy so we can bring everyone um, with us is, is even more important than ever before. Um, at the recent Bond conference, Simon Steele called education and public literacy the engine of you know behind climate action and i really think you know i really think education not only for you know school students or tertiary students but for executives um for for the public is is much more important than we realize and um yeah i'm very passionate about that obviously thanks yeah interesting we're getting into this conversation around just transition and a lot of the work that i do is focused on you know, how quickly we're going here whereas what i hear in, in the general parlance is a debate this is a zero-sum game, this is a trade-off. It's either growth, economically speaking, or we're looking after people and planet. Is that true? Is it always that simple in terms of that trade-off? I, I think the piece that's missing from that is the timescale argument. And I think the danger is that we get fixated on short-termism and that what might be a short-term cost actually brings long-term gain. And when you're dealing with governments who have a particular term in office, when you're dealing with corporates who plan over three years, five if you're lucky, you are really up against it in terms of that recognition of the long-term benefit. And actually what we're trying to do here is fundamentally tilt the economy, society, to operate in what is frankly going to look like a very different world in 20 or 30 years time. Um, so, so I think the, the answer to your question is probably no. It isn't a blunt trade-off, but it might be involving trade-offs in the short term in order to reap benefits in the long term. And I think there is still resistance to that, either because actually a lot of those leaders of organisations or countries won't be around when, or at least not doing those jobs when it matters. And also just, um, you know, this is a very different world that we are walking into. There's no precedent to a lot of this sort of stuff. Yeah. So arguably, individuals turn around and say, we'll prove it. And that's quite a hard thing to do sufficiently to drive action and change. Does anyone else want to come in on that? I, this, I, I may be actually completely off the mark here, but the way that I see this is, is that, that um, you cannot really change the First of all, I don't think, I, I agree with you, I don't think it's a it, 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 you know, black and white kind of thing. I do think that as long as this war is based on uh, of, of the language that we use is around turnovers and profits and uh, stuff like that, which are necessary, you know, are fine. We need to, to keep an eye on them. Um, we are on the, on the wrong track. What we need to be doing actually here is to, to develop a new narrative, you know, to develop strategies that address the, the issues that we have and to convince people to come in this journey with us, including banks, uh, governments. We have to reduce corruption, obviously, or as we call it here, sleaziness. Um, we have this corruption for everybody else, though. Um, we have um, to convince people that taxation is not a bad thing because this is how we actually improve society. Uh, and unfortunately, bringing back the, the political angle to this, this is not where we are right now, but we do need to do that work. If also all of us who actually believe that a positive change is possible to do this uh, convincing, if, if you wish. Thank you, Manuel. It seems like you're talking about people. Seb, do you want to jump in on that? I mean, you know, it, it, I, I completely agree with, with the way Matt, Matt summarised it, but I think we are seeing, um, you know, those investors that can take a longer term horizon are moving in this direction. So if you, you know, think of private investors, you know, wealthy families, for example, we're seeing a big generational change in the ownership of that wealth. And the drivers uh, in terms of the mandates that are being given to investment managers and, and investment consultants around you know, thinking longer term, thinking about uh, climate impact, thinking about broader social impact is, you know, really fundamentally changing the, the investment management industry. There's a long way to go, of course, but these, you know, conversations around triple bottom line, uh, you know, embedding impact, even, you know, really embedding ESG in a meaningful way. Um, you know, I think, I think we are seeing you know, from, from those investors that can take a longer term time horizon, and, you know, really sophisticated understanding of, you know, the longer term benefits. And, and yes, you know, there may be some short term pain, but, you know, the alternative is unimaginable. Thank you, Seb. Yeah. Um, 
I want to take the chance now to go to the audience just to ask if there are any particular questions that have been on your mind as we move through this conversation. We've got one big topic I want to discuss and then I'd really like to feed in some more live questions. We've had a couple of pre-submitted questions come in that we're going to use too. So a little nod to you to get those questions in when you can. Um, the fourth and final big topic of the day is around lessons for universities in terms of how do we work with private sector effectively? How are we scaling social impact solutions effectively? There's a bit of a a focus in that question there for you to maybe pick up on. Manuel, should we start over here? Yeah, sure. Um, so you're, you told me you're based in, in Nexus, right? Um, I, I really think that universities cannot work, cannot do this work alone, and they shouldn't be doing this work alone. Uh, it's not only the private sector, it's also governments. We, we need to bring everybody together. This is a, a, if we are going to, to have a transformational effect in the world and to, to, to turn it into a sustainable, long period or long time uh, success, we do need every little help we can. Uh, and, and working with, um, with the private sector is critical for that. Uh, the expertise that the private sector can bring in, I'm thinking of banking, not to go very far, uh, is, is critical to be able to, to, um, to be efficient with the resource allocation, with uh, the, even, even picking what you're going to, uh, to, to what you're going to try to make a difference. And, and here at the University of Leeds, as you know, we are actually trying to, to support startups um, in any, every possible way we can, uh, but also to work with, with uh, to fulfill the civic duty of the university to work with the, with the, um, the private sector uh, in the community as well, uh, to be part of, of those initiatives. And at the same time, you know, to actually create links, create um, relationships uh, from people, do, from businesses, and, and that they don't know each other, and the university can also be a conduit uh, to, to bring this different kind of expertise to tackle issues. What universities can do, and, and I, I really believe this, is to provide leadership in, in areas where it would be difficult for certain private um, um, parts of the private sector to do so. Uh, especially because we have, again, we have a civic um, a duty that, that allow us to do that. And we have the expertise as well. So very, many of our colleagues are actually, at the same time that they are uh, academics, they are actually uh, heavily involved in, in different kinds of, of uh, private initiatives. And, and this is actually, uh, uh, it's, it's quite good for, for their own students, but it's also good for the education of the whole sector because you see them appear in newspapers and on TV and, and they write op-eds for, for uh, for websites and uh, they happen and they can actually grow in their impact as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Nexus and of course Nexus is called that for the very reason mm -hmm. that of course it is that intersection between the external, the alumni community, the local community and of course academics and, and students alike. Um, Matt, if I can come to you next potentially on this one. So what lessons can universities learn from the private sector from your standpoint? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I'll pick up on, on some of what Manuel was saying around startups. And, and Oaknoth is a funder of scale-up businesses. And we've done a, a decent amount of research, actually, in the last year with the Social Markets Foundation around, actually, how do we, we get greater scale and the role, funnily enough, that universities have to play in that. And I, and I think there's a couple of angles to this. One, from, from a sustainable perspective, there are a lot of smaller startup companies that are becoming B Corps now that are sustainably minded because they're of a size where they can get it right from the outset yeah. and they're thinking that way. Uh, and there are also those in the sort of industries like climate technology um, where actually we need these new industries and these new startups to be growing at scale to try and actually solve these, these broad uh, systemic problems. Um, but, but I think a couple of things on that. One, there is a real skills problem in terms of m mainstream companies actually finding people with the right expertise and the right knowledge. And I think if you take a sort of national scattered approach to it, you're still kind of trying to pick the odd individuals everywhere. We actually need a, a, a coalescing, con convening power of knowledge. And actually, universities are probably the best places to do that and to drive innovation and research. And that means that maybe it is better to have particular sectoral hubs, be it biosciences or technology or engineering or whatever it might be and we build out those capabilities from universities for sectoral hubs where there is actually knowledge being built collectively collaboratively at scale i think other areas there that actually are, are really important are 
adult education so that we're not just relying upon the next generation coming through. Mm -hmm. Skills training as well as academic training mm -hmm. to kind of get that overlap because a lot of this stuff is practical as well as, mm -hmm. as academic knowledge. So we need to bring all these things together to actually get the in industries building at scale. And the other piece that I would say is actually around the investment side is that universities produce really good spin outs that sometimes incur or encounter what is known as the valley of death and that they never actually scale beyond. And I think there is an element there of, of actually universities being able to be slightly more relaxed about how much ownership they take over those. And I think you know there's an argument to say that arguably five or 10 percent of something is worth a lot more than 25 to 30 percent of nothing. And I think that awareness of the private sector in terms of how do you actually crowd private sector investment into something that is really valuable that's come out of university research, we compare these things better to actually get these things growing at scale so that everybody benefits. And I think there is there is progress that can be made there. And I think, um, you know, actually, universities have a really critical role to play as part of that ecosystem. And of course, these ventures don't operate within a vacuum. Seb, from your perspective, is that your? View yeah, I mean, as well? I, I would agree with with with, uh, with with everything that Matt said there. But I, you know, I suppose I would more broadly challenge the the assumption that kind of innovation purely sits within within the private sector. And and obviously, you know, I've been championing in this conversation that the role of civil society in in that uh, in that context as well. And you know, we need a, a funding ecology that you know supports organisations across um, the the different dimensions uh, of, of the uh, of the economy. I mean, I think you know one of the things that, that civil society can do in that uh, in that context, in partnership with with universities, is really start to kind of further interrogate, I suppose, what we mean by social impact in this in this uh, context. And you know, I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift in the um, in the sector, uh, the civil society sector. I mean, um, you know, to to really understand social impact in a perhaps a slightly more uh, holistic way, a way that is better suited to the conversation around networks and, and influence. Um, you know, for many years, charities have been using models like theories of change, where they, you know, think about um, the way the world is. They think about doing some activity, and they think about, you know, how the world will be, and it's all a kind of neat logical chain. And, and of course, you know, the world doesn't work like that. Social change doesn't operate like that. And I think, you know, the richness of this conversation is is in really highlighting the importance of networks as agents to change systems. And you know, in the context of my organisation. That's about um, yes, you know, we're fortunate to have significant resources to deploy, but but actually, you know, by really using those resources in a smart way, we can leverage in other resources to support civil society to a much much larger extent than uh, than we have at our own disposal. But crucially, by doing that, trying to share knowledge, influence an ecosystem of other financial institutions and government, as you as you rightly keep highlighting, because pretty small tweaks in things like the way government uh, provide guarantees to small businesses, if that can be applied to not-for-profit organizations as well, which fortunately it was during the pandemic, um, slightly unintended consequence from government, I think, but you know, made a huge impact in, in access to finance at a critical stage. So thinking you know, in, in, through a systems lens, which lends itself to think through a network lens, I think really highlights the importance of all that collaboration. Thank you, Seb. And we've had a question come in from the audience while you've been talking. And, and Susie, I want to pose this one to you, if I may. Yeah. Um, the question is, what role can universities play in advocating for policies that support knowledge equity and sustainability at a local, national, but also a global level? Absolutely. Well, I think one of the challenges for universities to work together with policymakers, governments and decision makers is that you know, we do speak different languages. We do operate on different timescales. We do um, have different agendas and stakeholders. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of work done at the, you know, science and research policy nexus. And, and there are many great um, solutions, including secondments and, you know, workshops, all kinds of things to bring those groups together. But I think something that I'm hearing a lot from governments and from uh, the UN is that, it's very hard for these organizations to, to, to amass research or to liaise with individual universities and individual researchers. There are so many universities out there. So what I'm hearing a call for is these knowledge networks, are these networks of higher education providers that come together, that collaborate and in a coordinated way, feed that research into policy and decision-making. So that's the call that I'm getting at the moment, if that's useful. 
And if I may, you know, coming back to the last point as well, I totally agree um, with what everyone is saying about universities being uniquely placed to convene knowledge networks, to bring corporates together with nonprofits, with communities and, and with government in, in a very unique way and to have challenging conversations that other groups cannot have. Um, I would just say from the perspective of higher education, one thing that can get in the way of these collaborations is the time and the uh, sort of frameworks that you need to collab collaborate across these diverse organisations. We don't factor that into workload models and sometimes we don't do that in an intentional way where you have a framework to create a shared language, to create a shared goal, shared set of values to be able to collaborate from. Thanks. Can I just add one thing? Please, yeah. There is one, uh, I agree with everything you say, Susie, every word, uh, but there is one thing that universities need to be better at and it's listening. Yes. So very often we, um, we I mean, I, most people who work on universities are idiosyncratic. They are, um, uh, they, they, they are full of ideas uh, and we are not shy about bringing forward our ideas when we're talking to partners and uh, but but something that we don't do enough is listening. And, and when you engage with new partners, when you go and you're trying to solve uh, local, regional, national, international, global problems, listening to what other um, um, key actors need to say, uh, what the concerns are, what their fears are, is, is really critical. And, and in, my, in my humble experience, uh, all these years doing this job, this is something that has, it has become very obvious to me uh, and and uh, uh, sadly it's not something that I have seen improve um, I have to say so listening getting better at listening uh, what what the other have to say is, is critical and, and that that is particularly so uh, relevant when when we you know with, with the United Nations when universities come together in one of these four um, it's, it's critical at those points everybody's listen that there is no monopolization of a conversation by a few. Mm. It's interesting you talk about listening and I guess listening depends on understanding other perspectives and also the language that these sectors, these individuals are using. Um, for example, our organization was born out of the work that we've done in Mexico and Latin America. And we talk a lot about change, hence the name Cambio. And of course, there's a rather simple um, challenge there around use of language and how we communicate things uh, in yeah. different contexts and different cultures. But perhaps at a framework level, and Susie, you were talking about frameworks. Um, we, we've spoken already about the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. We've spoken about ESG, Environment Social Governance. Are we talking about the same thing? What sectors understand which frameworks? Matt. Um, I mean, I think you can get bogged down with frameworks and definitions. I think there's a there's a there's a balance to strike. I think on the one hand, there's a confidence thing in terms of knowing the right course of action, and sometimes that requires a framework. It requires um, sort of tram lines to operate within, and 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 guidance as to the right approach to take. And I think frameworks have a critical role in doing that. Um, I think, at a slightly looser sense, even things like policy can just be signals and just signals of direction of travel. And then industry can kind of pick that up and run with it because they know that actually that is the way that things are going. And that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be overly prescriptive. Um, I think a classic that's happening in the financing world right now in relation to climate change is in relation to transition finance. So uh, most financial organizations out there might have some things on their books that are obviously dirty and some things on their books that are obviously green, but the vast majority of what they do is something in between. And how do you know with confidence that if you give funds to a slightly dirtier business in order to decarbonize, that you're not just facilitating the longevity of dirty activity? That's a really difficult thing that the industry really doesn't want to be making up on its own in case it comes back to bite them. They need a framework and a definition and a, and a, and a a set of guidelines to follow to say, actually, we know we're doing the right thing and we're actually putting funds in the right place to, to drive decarbonisation here. Yeah. So, so that's, that's just an example. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's different roles to play. And I, I think a lot of what's happened with, um, with the ESG industry right now and from an investment point of view is that people have chased labels or they've chased things that fit into particular buckets rather than thinking about what the actual impact is or what they're really trying to achieve. And, and that is the negative concept, uh, context of 
um, pursuing frameworks to to an end in their own right, where actually what you're trying to do is to fulfill a framework rather than the objective for which the framework is trying to guide you towards. Mm. Yeah. And while we're on that topic, I think it'd be remiss of us not to talk a bit about this perceived backlash against ESG. And we look at states like Texas and Florida in the US for examples of laws that have come forward to actually yep. disincentivize rather directly ESG practices within specific investments or sectors. Do you have a view on that? So uh, I think, you know, partly that is a symptom of what I was just saying around actually ESG just being about chasing frameworks and not actually driving meaningful impact and driving the wrong outcomes. Partly it is what was alluded to earlier around the politicization of a lot of these themes. And therefore it can be, particularly in the US, almost used as a political dividing line and a, and a weaponization, as the term is, around, around ESG. But I think just to turn that on its head, you can also look at the US and you look at what the US has done more broadly around, say, things like climate agenda. If you take regulation in the EU, that has actually been quite punitive in terms of saying, if you don't do this, then we'll come down quite hard on you if you don't disclose this. In the US, with things like the Inflation Reduction Act, it has been much more a case of, well, we're not going to be punitive, but we're going to say, if you do do this, then there's an awful lot of cash that's available to you. So there are incentives there to attract it. And I think you almost have to step away from the ESG labeling regime and think more about the fundamental commercials of these sort of things. If I look at that as a commercial lender, if I'm le lending to, for example, a property in Florida that might be exposed to flooding, yeah. I might well assess that there is a fundamental risk to lending against that. Could I label that as ESG criteria in my lending? Sure, yeah, I could do. But does that mean that that asset owner isn't concerned about that beachfront property flooding in Florida? Of course they are. And businesses and investors are actually fundamentally thinking about this now as part of long term value drivers, as part, as part of loss and damage and, and, and asset valuations. And it's not going away. It doesn't matter what you call it. And I think you almost have to detach and, and, and let's say not throw the baby out with the bathwater by eliminating ESG to what actually the underlying intentions are here. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think something that is very needed to, to, to tagging along with what you're saying is pragmatism. We are, we are living in a nation which people are getting very emotional. Social media has actually thrown the baby uh, you know, out of the, of the pram. We have a very emotional war in which um, um, activism has become more and more prominent on both sides of the aisle. You know, There is all this woke nonsense on the one side and there is intolerance on the other. And, and if we really want to move forward, we really need to go back to talk to each other. We really need to find ways of finding common ground among all of us, even if we are in completely different sides of, 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 a, of an issue, and come together and, and make sure that everybody can contribute in, it, in, in a meaningful way. If you want to drive change, you need to bring the dirty ones on site. You cannot uh, isolate them. You cannot ignore them. You need to bring them on site. You need to talk to them, convince them, persuade them, you know, incentivize them. Whatever you want to do, uh, in, in a way that actually they become part of a conversation. If you want to stop, for instance, oil production, isolation, I don't think it's gonna, it's not gonna work. You need to actually convince oil producers that they need to transition towards um, uh, green, green energy one way or another. They need to actually want to do this themselves eventually, not because we are putting pressure on them, and not because they are running out of oil, by the way. Um, so it's, it's really critical that we, we be, we start taking a more pragmatic approach to the problems that we have rather than an emotional one. And I really think that this is critical because if we don't, we keep widening the, the gap between between those who have an opinion here and the, and the ones who have the opinion on the opposite side. And, and that's not, we are seeing it. It's no, it hasn't been working at least since 2016. It hasn't worked. I'm struck by what you say, Manuel, there. You use the word woke in that context of the sort of extremes of the, of the debate. I want to pick up on that because we've had a question from the audience here about you know, how can universities ensure that we're inclusive in, in the conversation, including perspectives from marginalised, underrepresented groups that have, as they put it, equal access to educational resources and opportunities? What opportunity is there there for universities to provide this? You know, whether or not we agree with them. I'll come to you first. And then we yeah, may I mean, I, I, I don't know how it's uh, how Susie has it in, in Australia, but but we have, um, uh, and this is not just a University of Leeds. I think it's a whole sector. Um, uh, we are living in a, in a very um, 
neoliberal ecosystem uh, and and we have to to function within the system we function there is no there is no choice here what we can do is 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 to aim for meaningful change within that system that actually is going to empower people is going to um, make sure that uh, we widen participation in higher education and ideally in all education uh, uh, I mean if you look at what, what happened in the past, right? Quality education, which is one of the SEEs right now, it was not really in the in the agenda of the United Nations in the 1990s. If you look at all the things that came before the Sustainable Development Goals, education was, I mean, they created the United Nations University in, in Costa Rica in the 70s, but that's about it. Nothing else really happened. Um, and uh, nothing meaningful when it comes to change. Uh, for universities, in Australia and, and, and in the UK and many other parts of the world, we have to function within a, a particular ecosystem. Uh, for us, working, as I said before, with partners from all over the world, making sure that, that the education that we provide, we very often provide it in partnership with, with sets of lecturers from other parts of the world so that the, 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 the knowledge that we are actually imparting and, 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 and giving is actually not just ours, is critical, but also to make sure that education is not just for the few who can afford it. We need to make sure that more and more people are actually benefit from higher education, whether this is directly through um, going through A-levels directly to, to, um, to university or to um, um, uh, further education. There are, there are many ways in which we are trying to engage uh, with this. And there is quite a lot of online open education right now as well. Thank you, Manuel. Of course, that's from a UK perspective, Susie. Can we hear perhaps from a global perspective around so-called marginalised underrepresented groups? Um, yeah, absolutely. From 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 the UN perspective, um, you know, there have been critiques from you know marginalised or vulnerable groups, including youth, including women, including uh, uh, people from the SIDS, uh, the small island developing states, or the large ocean states, as they prefer to be known. Uh, a critique has been, yes, they're there for the photo opportunities, but they want a meaningful seat at the table in terms of policy. And I think part of the issue is in some of these big meetings, you know, some 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 countries are going to come with 25 lawyers and some, going to, some countries are going to come with none. So I, I think that's also part of the equation in terms of decision making and, and, and government. Um, if I might circle back to, to what Manuel was saying, I do also really take uh, I really do believe in a pragmatic approach to this problem. Um, I think we have to recognise that there's not going to be a perfect solution, that it is going to be messy, that there's no silver bullet in this space yep. and be okay with that. So, you know, we're we're still struggling to keep 1.5 degrees of warming alive. I, I'm not certain we're going to be able to make that, but every degree or half a degree counts. Everything we can do in this space counts. And I do also really believe that listening, collaborating, and humility and humanity are, are part of this. Um, and I think from the perspective of unis, we also have to move, and I think this is happening across the sector, but we do have to move towards, you know, what our key role is in society towards the common good. Um, you know, is it just the rankings or is it something more than that? And, and kind of walking the talk whilst recognising the neoliberal system that we do mostly work, work within, um, how can we focus on research translation and research impact and education impact more and more? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. No, thank you, Susie. We're moving into the final 10 minutes of the discussion today. And so what I want to do is give the panelists a question to reflect on, because I'm going to ask uh, in a moment, for us, as we close the session, for you to share a minute on, and this is a question posed by our audience here, what are the most urgent actions needed right now to accelerate progress towards knowledge equity and the SDGs. Before we get to that final question, so you've got a few minutes to prepare your thoughts, we've had one other question come in, specifically on the SDGs actually. So um, the question we have is, is knowledge equity in support of sustainable development goal four, quality education, is it a dream? Or can this actually become a reality? Are the barriers in current systems too constricting to be able to make a change with such ambition that is globally impactful i can say one thing about this one thing uh because i have i have been reading about this recently so this is this is this is acquired knowledge okay this is this is something i have i have actually read um uh, in academic articles and and websites in the past i think it's the past 30 years 
the the levels of illiteracy in the world have dropped by several uh, percentage numbers and and that is actually a very good sign and that is started even with the millennium goals that, that started before the sustainable development goals they have continued to drop uh, obviously when you're thinking about quality education you have to to take into consideration a number of factors uh, the distance that 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 any anyone who wants to be educated has to cover to get to a place where they can learn the access to technology. There are a million things that you have to consider. Um, not not to go very far. There are wars that are happening right now in which kids are being. I mean, everybody's being affected, obviously. And and for many of those who are involved in these wars, access to education right now is nearly impossible or impossible. Um, but there are also places where where. Basically, they get a bad government of one kind or another, and the access to education is immediately hindered. That those things happen. And to go back to what Susie was doing, you can do the best you can under under um, challenging circumstances at times, right? But the trend, for for what I can tell by reading again, this is acquired knowledge. Uh, the trend that I have seen in the figures is that the the illiteracy levels in the world have been dropped constantly and steadily for the past two or three decades. So this is a good sign. Whether we can get to a full, um, um, fully literal, literal, literal? Yeah, literal? <laughs> that's an interesting one. Uh, um, uh, society in every single country in the world, that's a different question. But we are definitely, it's one of these SEEs where you can actually tell based on, on figures that the movement is going in the right direction. Thank you, Manuel. Before we come to the final question, Seb, I mean, just in the spirit of, of positive uh, positive news, I mean, I think, you know, looking at, at institutions like the University of Leeds, you know, it's important in the context of this question to reflect on the, you know, the, the really intentional and deep work that goes on in terms of, you know, what we call widening participation, but, you know, fundamentally uh, giving people who, you know, have a family background or a geographical background that has excluded them and likely to exclude them from access to higher education and giving them that, that opportunity. And I know from the data that the, the university produces that you know the the socio-economic um, gaps that may be kind of apparent at the beginning of a university uh, education for, for those people who come in on a on a um, widening participation track can be almost you know effectively eliminated by the end of uh, of, of yeah. a degree and and so you know as tools of social mobility as tools of equity when uh, when thought of in that way you know we've got a we've got a strong track record so we've got a couple of really positive examples, perhaps, to end the general discussion on. But coming back to our final question, I'm going to start with you, Susie, this time. So what do you think are the most urgent actions needed right now to accelerate progress towards knowledge equity and the SDGs? Thank you. I'm biased on this one, but I think education, public literacy, public access to education, training, executive education, is most important um, across the world. Um, so that's what we call action for climate empowerment or it's article 12 of the Paris Agreement. And, you know, I mentioned before Simon Steele um, earlier this month spoke about that as being the engine for, or the tool, the main tool for empowering climate action. We need to bring everyone along with us. We need to make everyone care. And, and that is a whole of, you know, and we need, the whole of society to understand the scale of transformation that's required. So, you know, without sounding glib, you know, there are a portion of the population that think if I take the train and if I recycle, I'm doing my bit, everything's fine. It, 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 you know, there are some fundamental things about the Western lifestyle that we need to confront and we need to grapple with. And I think bringing the public along with us is, is really crucial. That is going to sway the votes and to sway the market. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Uh, and then Seth, please. Uh, probably not a surprise for me to say this, given given the conversation we've had. But I think you know, in the context of of knowledge equity around the SDGs, it's really about thinking of the the breadth of the networks that we need to be building and, and the role of different actors uh, within that. Um, and you know, that I think we're you know increasingly three, seeing through the way civil society thinks about um, delivering impact and system change is is the way that you know change happens and, and incentives shift across these broader systems that we know uh, need to uh, need to change. And so, you know, I would I would say really embedding the role of civil society organisations in those networks is key. Thank you, Seb. And Matt. So, from a I guess from a corporate side of things, um, uh, partly I'll, I'll echo some of what what Susie said earlier. Actually, around a lot of this stuff is happening in the wider world. If you are in a Western country, and I think individuals need to understand how it actually impacts their daily lives, and that might be how they 
heat their homes. It might be the cost of energy. It might be the cost of food. It might be something that is tangible and relatable to individuals to drive that traction en masse now. There's been a lot of focus on, on, on very high level, you know, let's talk about it from a climate change point of view, on heavy emitters, on the oil and gas industry and so on and so forth. We need to start distilling this to actually public level awareness and interpretation in a way that is meaningful for those who can actually take action at in their own homes, essentially. The other thing I would say is, and this touches on the kind of perhaps executive side, but just generally in terms of organisational leadership, I think there are those now trying to drive change on the ground here. And whether it be organisational leadership, whether it be political leadership, those in those positions have got there by virtue of being very good at managing the status quo. And we are not in the world of the status quo now. So there needs to be a way of getting those demand signals and feedback loops from those who are either directly experiencing this or those who are actually trying to drive change on the ground, whether that be here, whether that be in further flung places, um, to, to actually disseminate that information upwards so that actually there is awareness that things need to be done differently. And I think that is the, the next phase of delivering change, because I think we've, we've now got to the point where people are aware that there are these challenges. And they are aware that we need to be doing something about it. But the mechanism as to how to effectively do that is still missing. Thank you, Matt. And finally, Manuel. Well, I think that we need to break new ground on, on how the Global North and the Global South engage with each other, how they access um, knowledge and resources, how they are shared as well, uh, because what we have right now is not it. Uh, there need to be leadership, um, leadership that, it, that is, can actually be a visionary, can be inspiring, uh, and they have to be engaged at all levels. Uh, from both sides, but but we cannot continue the way we go in a war in which the global north basically uh, determines to a large extent what happens in the whole planet. Uh, our needs determine what happens in the planet. Our, our principles determine what happens in the planet. Our way of doing things is a way that we want everybody else to do things in the planet. And we need to learn as well. We need to listen and we need to learn. But finding that common ground is is critical. Thank you, Manuel. And, and that's it. Thank you to our entire panel for this invigorating conversation. But of course, there's much work still to do. So the conversation continues. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Of course, thank you to Helix for this wonderful facility and of course, the Knowledge Equity Network for hosting the discussion. And I know that the Knowledge Equity Network would like the conversation to continue. So for all of those of you who've joined us live and those that are watching back recorded, there is a declaration on Knowledge Equity that we would love you to sign. And there are a whole series of panel events like this that we are structuring over the coming months as we build towards 2030. So please join us for that. But thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day.